So ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce to you and please join me in welcoming to this celebration and to Southwest Louisiana, a tremendous, tremendously accomplished woman, Judge Janine Pirro. You are so welcome. Really. Thank you, Judge. I, uh, I am thrilled to be back in Louisiana. I think, uh, Louisiana, I think it is my third time in, uh, in about 12 months that I've been here. I love to come, I love the weather, but most of all, I love the food. Uh, and I love the people, and uh, it is always fun to come here. And I thank you for the invitation. I thank the organization, and I also want to thank uh, Lily Brady. I don't know where Lily is. Where are you, Lily? There she is over there, Lily, for being the, uh, the liaison and, and making sure that everything was uh, uh, together so that I could be here uh, and, and certainly be able to get back to New York in order to do my show on the Fox News Channel. Uh, I also want to welcome you here. There are a lot of politicians here, a lot of judges here. I almost feel like I'm at a uh, political convention. We have a senator here, uh, the sheriff is here as well. Where's the sheriff? I didn't see the sheriff. There he is, hello sheriff. Always good to have law enforcement in the room. We come together on Constitution Day. I was really surprised that it wasn't until 2004 when it became an official federal holiday. After all, it was in 1787 that the delegates met to sign the Constitution in Philadelphia, 11 years after they first met to declare their independence from the tyranny of King George. And the document that was so sacred to them and so essential in terms of their vision for the future is a document that unfortunately I think today is in a great deal of trouble. Judge Castle talked about the fact that judges are not there to be activists. Judges are there to make sure that they interpret the law, that they follow precedent. I worry about that at times, and I was a judge. I worry about judges who take it upon themselves to go outside of their job. And that's why I stepped off the bench. I was an elected county judge, and I had a 10-year term, and I had been an assistant DA, as, as Judge Castle had indicated, and I wanted to go back. Law enforcement was in my blood. It's what made me feel alive. I couldn't be a referee. I had to be in the trenches fighting. I understood the limits of my role as a judge. And in order to be an activist, I had to get down from the bench to do what I wanted to do. And you know, the one thing about the Constitution that is so important is the fact that government receives its powers from the consent of the governed. I'm not quite sure people in Washington understand that anymore. I'm not quite sure that they understand that they work for us. When you look at legislators and congressmen and senators and even their spouses who come into office, you know, middle income, ordinary income, and leave multimillionaires, you realize that something is wrong. And I think that one of the biggest problems that, as it relates to the collection of wealth that so many in Congress seem to have when they leave, is the lack of term limits in the United States. Politicians, and they are held in such low esteem, I don't have to tell you, but politicians are more interested in the next race, the next election, what committee, one hand washes the other, who's gonna raise money? And I understand that Congress, I mean, the, 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 the founding fathers wanted Congress to be close to the people. And that's why they had them run every two years. Senate, of course, every six years. But the thinking was, 
The people in Congress should go back into their communities. They should go back to be with their people. But what has happened is it's nothing more than, you know, a turning point where they can go out, get money to come back again. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And I'm telling you that our founding fathers are turning in their graves when they look at what is happening to the Constitution. I'm gonna start with the First Amendment. The First Amendment is all about the freedom of speech. As sure as I'm standing here, and hopefully not gonna fall off this stage, uh, I am telling you that your freedom of speech is in jeopardy. Why? Have you ever heard of something called Sharia law? Of course you have. Sharia law is the law that is the antithesis of the Constitution. And yet there are courts across this country where there are efforts and where are there actual, there are actual implementations of Sharia law in settling court cases. And that's why there is this movement in the United States to have something called American Laws for American Courts. Nine states have already passed that legislation so that Sharia law is not something that can be implemented in their state. Now, why would we have to pass a law saying that someone else's religious law will not be controlling, let alone be, be considered in our courts. Come along with me for a minute. There is a UN resolution, 56, that Hillary Clinton was a part of, and I believe signed on to, where she was, along with several of the countries uh, with OIC, uh, the Organization of Islamic Countries, got together and said, you know what, we want to pass um, a, a resolution, just a UN resolution. The people should not be able to criticize religions of other people. Now, where do you think that's coming from? That is coming from the Muslim religion. The Muslim religion, they'll chop your head off. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. They will kill you if you in any way criticize Muhammad or if you even draw his picture. I don't have to go through it. You people are, you know the news as well as I do. And so our president comes out and he says, you know what? We shouldn't be criticizing other people's religion when it comes to the Muslim religion. Our president is more concerned about the religion of Muslims than he is about the religion of Christians. Example, he is. Example, at the national prayer breakfast, I couldn't believe my ears when the President of the United States gets up and says, get off your high horses. This isn't something that's new in, in, in history. This has happened before. Translation, Christians, it's your turn. And yet this same President will not, under any circumstance, say Islamic extremism, Muslim extremism. He will not use the term, but it's worse than that. He has scrubbed the terms from the FBI lexicon, from a lot of the government ex uh, lexicons, and even after Benghazi, Michael Morell, who was the head of the CIA after Petraeus was moved, gets up before Congress, puts his hand on the Bible, swears to tell the truth, after we've been trying to figure out who changed the talking points to Benghazi, he said, oh, I took the word Muslim out from in front of extremists. And so they said to him, why did you take Muslim out? 
He said, well, you know, we, we didn't want to um, uh, uh, not infuriate. We didn't want to make them more angry. We didn't want to uh, uh, get, make them upset. Get them more angry. They want to kill us. Those are the guys who flew into the World Trade Center. You don't want to hurt their feelings by saying it's Muslims? What if somebody is in the army? What if somebody is in the military? Who are they going after? The Buddhist extremists? The, I mean, who, who? Are they going after, you know, uh, uh, Boko Haram? Are they going after the right-wing extremists? They're going after the Muslim extremists. He doesn't want to say it. He doesn't want to say that Major Nidal Hassan is a Muslim terrorist. And you know what the shame of that is? And he wants us to believe that he believes, the president believes in, in veterans and taking care of all of us. That's a bunch of hogwash. You know why? Because when he called the shooting at Fort Hood workplace violence, he prevented those who were injured from getting the medical care, the continuing medical care that they needed. And so Congress had to pass a law years later so that they would be able to get the care that they needed. And then when he says, you know, I didn't know anything about the VA. Of course he knew about the VA. Which brings us to a whole other issue, but I'm not done with Sharia law. Your First Amendment right to say what you want about Islam will be pulled back if there is another Democratic pres a Democrat who is a president, S especially if it's Hillary Clinton. We can use taxpayer money for ex exhibits like Piss Christ, where you put a crucifix in the urine of the artist, and then they put it in a museum, and it is paid for by the uh, endowment for the arts. The endowment for the arts pays for Mary and the Dom, which is uh, a painting of the Virgin Mother with some pornographic photo and cow dung all over it. We pay for that. And our president comes out and says, we cannot attack Islam, I will not attack Islam. Sharia law will cut back on your right to discuss Islam. Now let's talk about the establishment of religion. This, in the same in the First Amendment. You've got the woman in Kentucky who made a decision that it was against her religion for her to issue a marriage license for gays. To me, freedom of religion is the most significant, probably more significant, than any of the other rights in the Constitution. And if we don't recognize that, they're gonna keep chipping away and chipping away at our freedom of religion. Because now the, the playing field is kind of level. You know, you Christians, you did all that bad stuff, aside from the fact that this is a country founded on Judeo-Christian ethics. And the Islam, the Muslims, we gotta, we gotta make sure we protect them. We can't say anything bad about them. Islam is a religion of peace. That's a bunch of hogwash. It's not a religion of peace. I know it is not a religion of peace. And I don't want to hear any more about how we have to respect them or how we have to make sure that they're comfortable. God bless them. They want to come in, that's great. But you follow our laws. You don't change American laws to institute Sharia laws in American courts where our founding fathers 200 years ago, 250 years ago, gave up everything, their family, their fortune, their finances, everything, their home, to start a country where you had freedom of religion, freedom of speech. That's not where we're going, folks. That's not what's happening in this country. When I first had my show, Justice with Judge Janine, I figured we'd do crime. That's my wheelhouse. I did it for 32 years. I'm not doing crime. 
I'm doing politics. I'm doing politics because the basic foundation of our country, the Constitution, is being trampled upon every day. Let's go to the Second Amendment. Guns. It's real clear. The Constitution says you can't infringe upon our right to bear arms. The United States Supreme Court agrees. And yet we have a president at every turn who wants to cut back on your right to have a weapon, who wants to cut back on ammunition, who is buying ammunition so you can't buy ammunition so the shelves are empty, and Rahm Emanuel in Chicago is sending letters to the manufacturers and the banks saying don't give money to people who manufacture guns and bullets. And they have the nerve to say that when Chicago is the murder capital of the United States of America because the only people who have guns are the criminals. You and I, you and I have to prove that we, have, that, that we should have a gun. Now, I was a judge, I used to sign pistol permits. When I was a DA, I had a gun. I have lots of guns. I have long guns, I have short guns, I have little guns, I have big guns. I may be from New York, but I'm from upstate New York. Anybody know upstate New York? Elmira, did you ever hear of it? No, huh? Or, huh, where? Lockport, Brockport, Buffalo. I used to take the bus there. I went to school, I went to school in Buffalo. Yeah, it was really cold, and I worked in a dairy, and uh, I'm really from small-town America, where, you know, life was good. You went to church every Sunday. Everybody knew everybody else. Education was important. Everybody loved each other. You could buy a decent tomato. You can't have that anymore. Uh, but when the president comes out, and he says that Sandy Hook, and I reported on Sandy Hook, I was there, it's an hour from my house, not even. I reported uh, at that, from that uh, school area where the, uh, where the kids were shot. I was in Aurora, Colorado within 24 hours of the shooting by homes there. Terrible things happen with guns. But I'm gonna tell you something, in my 30 years in law enforcement, there was only one time an individual with a legal gun killed someone. It's the illegal guns that are killing people, not the legal guns. I want you to think about something. Boston bombing. City is on lockdown, martial law. You've got the one Sarnaya brother, he got, he's dead, he got run over by his brother. And you got the other one who's running around, all right? He's in a residential area. He is on a boat. They find him on the boat. Let's say you live in the house and you call 911. You call 911 and you say, I hear somebody. They're gonna say, too bad, it's a burglary, it's every man for himself. If they are not going to protect us, if 911 doesn't come, Who's going to take care of you? You have a right to have a gun. You have not only a right, you have a natural right, a God-given right. Washington didn't give you the right to have a gun. Nobody there has the right to tell you you can have a gun. You have a right as an American to have a gun, to carry a gun, to have as many guns as you want. And you don't have to explain why you want one. And you don't have to explain why you want 28 of them. It doesn't matter, it's nobody's business. And don't give me this hogwash about how, oh my God, you know, don't kill Bambi and all that stuff. You don't need an AR-15 to kill Bambi. Yeah, no, I don't, but I need an AR-15 to kill the dirt bag who's coming down to make sure he takes me out, either to steal what I have or because of what I've done. So, you know, that, a quick story. So I'm working at Fox and someone says to me, 
Janine, your name was in the paper about that, that thing in Westchester. I said, yeah, well, what else? I mean, you know, so, well, what was in the paper for? Well, you have a gun. I said, yeah, I have a gun. I have lots of guns. In Westchester, the Journal News, uh, and in Westchester and Rockland, I think, they identified everyone who had a, a, a gun, a pistol license, pistol permit. They didn't just identify us. They did an interactive map on how to get to our houses, okay? Now, I've, I've spent my life, three decades, arresting, well, investigating, arresting, indicting, trying, convicting, then sentencing defendants. You think there are a few people out there who don't like me? And now, you can add a few fanatical Muslims to it, too. All right? They have the gall to put in the newspaper, not just me, I'm a big girl, I get it, but the battered woman who got a gun because this guy has threatened to kill her or he's stabbed her a few times, or a cooperating witness or someone who's undercover, or a corrections officer so that the inmates know where the wife and kids are when the corrections officer's working. So I call him up and I say, you want to come on my show? Tell me why it was important to put my name and address in the newspaper in an interactive map that I used to fight for to get in your paper for pedophiles when I was prosecuting them. No, we're not going to come on your show. Of course you're not going to come on the show. So then we send the producer. And then I send another producer. And then Bill O'Reilly got involved. And then guess what? The people who wanted to, oh, the reason they put us in the paper, they put us in the paper, oh, in the, this is what they wrote, in the aftermath of Sandy Hook, the shooting of all those little kids, it was important for people to know who in their neighborhood had a gun. In the aftermath of the shooting at Sandy Hook, it's important to know who has a gun. Wait a minute, you're connecting me with Sandy Hook? What do I have to do with that dirtbag nut job whose mother let him get a gun? I got it legally. I went through hoops to get this gun. But that's the thinking. They demonize us. Don't take it. That's why this election is so important. This election is essential because we're going to hell in a handbasket. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. Let me talk about the 14th Amendment. You know that birthright citizenship thing? Is Donald Trump right or wrong? You like Donald Trump? I do. I like Donald Trump. I do. I'm going to read this to you. 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Uh, da, 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 da. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive people of you know, the due process, life, liberty, pursuit of property, and all that stuff. Okay? The key subject to the jurisdiction. The thinking is, and I had a guy, a professor on my show, and I said, has the United States Supreme Court ruled on the 14th Amendment and the issue of whether someone who is the child of illegals automatically becomes a citizen? And he said, yes. I said, what case? He said, Wong Kim. Anybody know that one? Okay, I don't expect you to know, it's not a test. I think it was 1870, okay? Wong Kim's parents, he said, were Chinese, they were Asians, and when the United States said that they were going to allow the kid who was born here to be a citizen, he said that that was proof that illegals who come here and have children can give birth to American citizens. Wrong. He didn't read the case. They were Chinese. They did come to the country. But they were here on a, on a permanent visa. 
They were legally allowed to come into the United States. And therefore, the United States said, your child is uh, American, uh, and he can also be, you know, I guess a, a, a child of, of, of China as well, uh, a citizen of China. He'll have dual citizenship, okay? Don't let anyone tell you that the Supreme Court has ruled on it because it has not. And don't let anyone tell you that that's what this little book says. The 14th Amendment does not say that. There is no case on it. But I'll tell you what there is a case on. Congress in 1923 passed a law making a category of people citizens uh, who are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. I forget the name of the, uh, I got too many judges here, I should look this up. Uh, of course I didn't bring it with me. Uh, where Congress has the right, ah, 1923, Congress uh, um, granted citizenships, that's it, to all Native Americans. Initially, Native Americans were not citizens under the Constitution. They were exempt. Congress, in 1923, passed a law and said, Native Americans are citizens. What does that tell you? That tells you that even though the 14th Amendment of the Constitution did not include Native Americans, Congress had the right to pass a law to include them. So Congress has the authority to do whatever they want when it comes to the issue of birthright citizenship. Now, I'm only gonna speak for a few more minutes. The first order of government is the protection of its people. That is not the first order of the Obama administration. I can spend a long time talking to you, but let me make it real short. We had two men on a rooftop in Benghazi. They knew what was happening. They had satellites, they had drones, they had audio, they had telephones, they had Greg Hicks on the ground, the highest ranking officer, telling them what was going on. And they came out and told us it was a video. So I live in New York, a lot of Democrats in New York, you know? So my friends say to me, well, what's the big deal? What is the, re I said, the big deal is honesty. There is no honesty in this country anymore. When politicians lie to us, when our president says you can keep your doctor, you can keep your health care, and yeah, it was a video, and Susan Rice is the greatest thing that ever happened since sliced bread, or since, uh, uh, well, uh, whatever. Um, that tears at the fabric of our society. That teaches kids that it's okay to lie. That kind of dumbs down our morality. What it does is it just makes it acceptable. And people say to me, oh, all politicians lie. No, not all politicians lie. I ran for office five times in New York. It's a blood sport. I've got the scars to prove it, too. I didn't get ahead lying. You don't lie. And if we start accepting that, and if we start accepting people like Hillary Clinton, people say to me, oh, you and your emails. Yeah. It's not about emails. I watched her tonight in the hotel. She gets on uh, uh, Wolf Blitzer, the Situation Room, and she said, "Ah, oh, 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 such a I should have used two emails. Wrong. It's not about emails. It's about a server. It's about the security of the United States of America. It's about the fact that we have a four-star general, David Petraeus, who is convicted of, of disclosing classified materials and to a woman, Paula Broadwell, and she had national security clearance. You know, okay, whatever. This woman, on the day that she is nominated as Secretary of State, she goes out and she builds or buys a private server. She then gets two other people in the State Department 
on that private server with their own emails. I don't care what email you use if you're on a government server. By not being on a government server, classified, top secret information was not secured. It wasn't even archived. That's our, it, that, those are our documents, our secrets. And she had the arrogance to say, I'm not going to give you those. And it gets worse. For the four years or five years, however long it was that she was in the State Department, there are things called freedom of information requests, FOIL, uh, a FOIA, whatever you call it in your state. She had people from the State Department go into federal court and say, we don't have anything relevant to that request from the media, from the press, from uh, individuals, from other government agencies. They lied to federal judges. We have nothing relevant. We have nothing personal. We have nothing that is pertinent to this FOIA request. I'm telling you, if I were one of those federal judges, I would go through every affidavit and bring every one of those State Department lawyers in and say, right now, you have perjured yourself to a federal court and a federal judge. I'm holding you in contempt. That's the one thing that has to happen. There are no consequences. There are no sanctions. What happens in this country today is, oh, well, whatever. Let's let, just let bygones be bygones, whatever. And it gets worse with Hillary. Do you know why she had the three of them on the private server? You've got Uma Abedin. Do you know who she is? Okay, everybody knows Uma. She's married to that, you know, uh, that. <laughs> That paragon of virtue, Anthony Weiner, a.k.a. Carlos Danger. And uh, she's on the server, and Cheryl Mills is on the server. Cheryl Mills is the pitbull lawyer that Hillary has had for 20 years work for her. So the three of them are communicating the whole time. And Hillary, under the Federal Archives Act of 1950, is supposed to archive all of the information State Department uh, discussions. She doesn't do that. 2005, there's a new law. 2009, there's another law that requires not only that everyone do their business on a government server, but that she, as the head of the State Department, is the head of archiving, in charge of archiving that stuff. Google contacts the government and the State Department. Google says you need to know that uh, foreign governments are hacking the emails of government employees. As a result of that, Hillary sends out an email to all State Department employees saying, you must be on a government server. No personal emails for government business. She actually sent the memo out. But of course it didn't apply to her. So, why didn't it apply to her? Just come along with me and see if what I say makes sense. You've got Uma Abedin, who's being paid by the State Department. She's also being paid by the Clinton Foundation. She's also being paid by the Tenio Foundation, which is a Tenio Corporation, which is a Clinton-connected company. The woman's getting three paychecks and she's working for us. It's, it's unheard of. You don't, this doesn't happen in government. You know that. You're working full time for me. Uh, you're not taking a check from someone else. You want to know why? Because of the Clinton Foundation. When Hillary said that she would disclose all of the money that the Clinton Foundation got when she became Secretary of State and that Bill would pass everything through the ethics officer in the State Department, et cetera, et cetera. She wanted to continue to collect money. Uma Abedin, by working for the Clinton Foundation, as well as the State Department, and because she's such a good friend of Hillary's and so close to her, can monitor the money and make sure that money that they don't want disclosed still goes into the foundation and is not disclosed. 
And of course, when we find out 25 million from this company, uh, country, 50 million from that country, I know it was Algeria or Saudi Arabia or one of them, she said she wouldn't take money from them. And it wasn't disclosed. Not to mention the wheeling and dealing of Bill Clinton. He was America's middleman. I mean, this is the world's middleman. Somebody wants to buy uranium from Canada in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, Bill Clinton's gonna make the deal happen. So you say to yourself, okay, so what? It's going to Clinton Foundation, it's going to a good cause. You're being political. No, I'm not. A 501c3 is the Clinton Foundation. That 501c3 gives, depending upon what you believe, eight to 10% of the money goes to grantees. 85% goes to former Clinton employees, Clinton political operatives, travel, meals, expenses, hotels. We're talking about an organization that is worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. The Bill Hillary Chelsea Foundation. And yet, you look at the other side, if you're a conservative and you want to get a 501c3, they're going to nail you. You're going to wait for years. I believe that if they investigated that foundation, that Clinton Foundation, there would be more to find there than there is with the emails. And make no mistake, the law was violated by Hillary. She knew it. She knew that she was supposed to keep that stuff on the server, and she intentionally did not. And if she didn't, and she lies. I mean, but there we go again. Yeah, she lies all the time. She lied and said, I had no classified information on the server. Then I had no classified uh, on, on my email, emails. Then I had nothing that was marked classified. Of course not. But you're having your own server. You wouldn't let it go through the State Department where they could capture it and mark it. That was intended to stop any overlook, any oversight. And if you don't believe me, she wouldn't let the, the uh, Inspector General the whole time she was there, she would not let the Inspector General into the State Department. So she has no emails, no FOIAs, no oversight by the Inspector General. This is America. This isn't supposed to happen. And yet, eh, whatever, it happens. The deal with Iran, we're not safe. We're not safe. When the president says, and John Kerry says, we don't know what's in the agreement between the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and Iran, do you believe that? Do you believe it? And the law that was passed by Congress in 2015 says that the government, is to, our government, that means Kerry and Obama, are supposed to tell us what's in any agreement or anything that's an annex to the Iran nuclear deal. And they just go around and say, no, we don't know what's in it. Here's what's in it, folks. Iran is now allowed to just send soil specimens to the IAEA. That's it. There is no inspection. They can keep their centrifuges. There is nothing that we can do. You've got to give them 24 days notice and then it could go on to 30, 40, 50 days. These people, Iran, Tehran, they are, the, they, they are the head of all the terrorists in the world. Hamas, Hezbollah, Tehran, Iran. Remember 79, that's when it all started. I was at a dinner the other night and I was sitting next to someone who showed me pictures of what it looked like when he went to Iran. On government buildings, and I'm gonna put this on my show because I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Government buildings, the American flag, and you know where the stripes come down? There are bombs at the bottom. It says, kill Americans. They have uh, uh, blood all over the American flag. I mean, he sent me a whole host of, of, of pictures. I don't have to tell you this. Your instincts tell you that we are dancing with the devil. Why are we dancing with the devil? 
I don't know. I know what I think. And so what that does is it brings us to what we have to do. If we don't make a difference next year, it's over. I'm not here to give you bad news. I want to give you great news. But it is over. Last night when I watched that debate, I, was ex I love politics, always love politics. I love it. I was so excited. Did you see the intelligence on that stage? I mean, compare that to Hillary and Bernie. I mean, you know, th these, I mean, Marco Rubio is so smart, all right? I mean, you know, Cruz is smart. I don't care if you like him or you don't like him. It was great listening to people who have it. Carly Fiorina had it, all right? She's brilliant. I don't know who should be president, but you know what? We got a great bench there, and we got to make it happen. I'm going to open it up to questions, but I want to say one more thing for those men and women in law enforcement. You do it for us every day, and we thank you for that. And that's going to change in the next administration, too. The idea that police have to look both ways to worry about someone who's going to shoot them. I mean, there's a, in New York City, it is wild. You've got a mayor there, de Blasio, who hates cops. He hates them. And you know what? When the cops turn their back to him, I said, good for them. Good for them. It's time for people to take a stand. You're with us or you're against us. It's right versus wrong, truth versus a lie. Our founding fathers are spinning. They are spinning right now. You think Obama hates cops? You think? <laughs> what he has done to law enforcement, forget about trashing them. Forget about, you know, the mentality that people are starting to think is acceptable mentality. I mean, he has put them in danger. He put a bullseye on their back. He ran to Ferguson. Ferguson, I'm gonna tell you straight, Michael Brown was a thug. He was a thug who went into a, 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 li a little store and pushed around the owner. He grabbed the cigarillos or whatever it was, knocked the guy over when he tried to stop him, and walked out. He was a thug. He grabbed a cop's gun, and he expects to get away with it. This cop's life is over. He left the force. And Obama comes in with Eric Holder, and they're like, oh, you know, it's so horrible. We're going to fix this. You couldn't even get the Justice Department to file a civil rights violation. You're so full of it. That's the last thing I'm going to say. I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you. You got to leave, Senator? They, who's the Senator? Somebody's got to go. I saw them. I recognize it. Okay, what do you want to ask me? Yes, sir. No, an executive order is not in the Constitution. An executive order is something that generally is uh, naming a, uh, uh, yeah, a particular day. It's like a county executive. Or you, what is your county executive called? You don't have a county. You have a parish. It's not a priest. Huh? Sorry, I went to Catholic school. Uh, your president, I mean, don't, do they issue things like it's John Smith Day in, uh, in the parish, okay? Executive orders are something that have, they have little legal import, all right? And they've been used and they've been accepted and, you know, they don't have to be followed by every president. So they're really not that significant. They're not longstanding. This president has made it very clear. He doesn't believe that Congress has the right to legislate. He believes that he does. So he uses this pen and the phone and his executive order to do things that he doesn't have a right to do. He doesn't understand the separation of powers. 
Congress passes laws. He doesn't pass laws. He's supposed to enforce laws. He doesn't enforce laws. He lets immigrants come in. He lets, I mean, wait, it's not over. It's not over. Trey Gowdy sent a, do we like Trey Gowdy? I always ask that. Trey Gowdy sends a letter to the administration wanting to know about the refugee program. He sent the letter before the summer. They, he was waiting until the fall, and I'm gonna have him on the show either this week or next week to talk about the refugee program. In the letter, he writes to the White House. He says, who are these refugees that are coming into my county? So it's not like he's looking you know, over his shoulder to find something wrong. It's in his own county. And the White House directs him to the State Department. And the State Department sends a letter and says, we followed all the guidelines, we met all the people in your county who were in charge of this kind of thing. So he writes a letter back and says, pray tell, who is in charge of this kind of thing in my county? So the State Department, like months later, writes a letter. And he said, I've never heard of these people. I don't know who they are. It's almost a charade. It's like when the young kids were coming in from, from Central America. Come on in. You're an MS-13, you kill people to get into the gang? Come on in. You're a little kid from a country, we don't know who's got a vaccination, who doesn't. Come on in, we'll send you to Vermont, we'll send you to Massachusetts, Virginia, California, Pennsylvania. The country is changing. There's only one way to stop it. We have to win. There are seven states that will make a difference this election is not a national election. I don't care what anybody says. We have an electoral co uh, college and there are swing states. Look them up, you know what they are, all right? The swing states, Nevada, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, Florida. I said Pennsylvania. Colorado, Nevada. Oh, no answers from that end. <laughs> That's where, the, that's where you have to go. Use social media. I don't care, emails, blogs, whatever you have to do, use it. Get the word out there. You know, when I, when I used to run countywide, before I ran statewide, I used to go into the nursing homes. I could, I could get 300 people in one shot, all right? Just make sure they all voted but you had to go in real close to the election so they remembered who came in to see them. <laughs> and you know, you gotta think, just get creative. We can make a difference, we can make it happen. There are more people who think like you, but they stay home and that is, that is a sin. I don't care the evangelicals, the Mormons, the this one, the, get out there. Being an American, it comes first when it comes to the election. We can't afford it, our kids can't afford it, the debt is too high, we gotta make a change. I'll take one more question, then I'm gonna go. Yes, sir. Dad, yeah, you. Well, the Tenth Amendment has to do with uh, the rights that the states have. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that, 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 that the, the laws that are not, um, that the, the Constitution doesn't give to Congress and that is not specifically prohibited to the states is reserved for the people or the states, all right? So Congress can't run any, everything, and I don't know what you're talking about if there's a specific topic you're talking about. But, you know, the states should be able, if something is not, if they're not prohibited from regulating it or, or, or writing a law about it, they're in charge. It's states' rights versus federal rights. But what, in what context?
I said, how many of you took Latin in school? <laughs> you had to be really old to take Latin. I did. Okay. No, I'm talking about myself. I did. That's why I wasn't talking about I was talking about me. Okay. Uh, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So, for example, in the 14th Amendment, Congress has the right to pass laws relating to naturalization, okay? So that's an example of the Constitution giving to Congress a right that they can control. Therefore, the states cannot control naturalization or immigration. Only Congress can. But uh, if it isn't reserved to Congress, and if it's not prohibited to the states, then the states can regulate it or, 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 or draft legislation, or the people can. Okay, that's the Tenth Amendment. It's federal versus state rights. They gutted it. Nobody's ever heard of it anymore. That's what the judge, he wanted to know. Yes. You know, I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I'm going to tell you something. The question is, why is the mainstream media so protective of the Democrats? I live in New York. I work in Manhattan. My friends are, you know, for the most part, they, they're, they're very liberal. They don't understand what's wrong with me. They think I've gone to the dark side, okay? They think differently. It's as though, um, you know, they used to call them limousine liberals. It's as though, oh, let everybody in. Oh, you know, better the guilty go free than one innocent be convicted. Um, you know, it's happening over there. It's not happening over here. It, it is this allegiance to the Democratic Party. I don't understand it. The Democratic Party right now is so far left, it isn't even recognizable anymore. It's almost like the country. We're not recognizable anymore. No one respects us. No one's afraid of us. I mean, you've got Egypt, our one friend in the Middle East, along with Israel. Egypt, under Morsi, who was a Muslim brother, was getting all kinds of equipment and, and, and uh, fighter planes and helicopters from the United States and money, all right? The Egyptian people, all Muslim, by the way, overthrow the Muslim brother, Morsi. Why? Because he wanted to impose Sharia law. Even though they're, I, I think it's 90% Muslim or 80%, I'm not sure. Even though they're Muslims, they don't want Sharia law. They want a nation state. They don't want a religious state. They don't want a theocracy like Iran, all right? Egypt is now, because now that they had this overthrow of the Muslim brother and they have this General El Sisi, who I've met, who's a great guy, who come, comes to the United States hat in hand, and says, can, can I have the tanks and the, and, the, uh, and the fighter jets and this and that? No, we won't give it to them. Two years, we wouldn't give it to them. You know where they're going to buy their, their uh, 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 munitions and everything else? Russia. And for this Iran deal, Obama comes out and says, if they cheat, we'll know it. You will not and you don't care. You know why? They cheated last month when Suleiman from Iran goes to Russia in violation of the sanctions and he's negotiating to buy arms. And now we know a month later it's so that they, the, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard can get their military equipment from Russia. Now Russia's going in. So you've got Tehran, 
and you've got uh, uh, Iran and Russia going against or joining Assad, and you've got the three of them now, we don't have a chance. It's a shame. And so you have to wonder, what do we do? Do we go back? What do we do? Because as Jim Comey said, it's coming here. Right now, it's in every state. It is coming. I didn't think that answered your question, but yes. Yeah, I know, I'm not good at this. Hmm. Nothing. He's not going to be impeached because he is who he is. You got it. Now, it's not right because the color of someone's skin does not matter. And no one said it better than Ben Carson when he said, when I operate on somebody, I don't care. I don't even look at the color of their skin. I look at their insides. That's why it's not being impeached. All right, now what was the rest of your question? It was more... Ah, voter registration. Okay. No voter ID laws in some states. It's been knocked down. I want you to think about this. You've got voter ID laws that are being knocked down across the country. Justice Department is fighting them tooth and nail. And then you've got something called motor voter. Motor voter means that you can register and vote in the same day. So let's assume that you're an illegal and you live in my neck of the woods. If you live in New York, you can go to Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Jersey. You can vote four times. You can give them a new name every time. You don't have any ID. You don't have to prove anything. That's how elections are stolen. And nobody cares. Maybe we should. I didn't say that. Um, and nobody cares. And I'll tell you my own experience when I was a DA. We had someone who was cheating on absentee ballots. Had a great case. It was a solid case. The jury didn't care. I put some of my best people on it. Jury didn't care. They're like, eh, that's not a real crime. You know, everybody does it. And that's the danger. The more people think everybody does it, the deeper we're in trouble. I want to thank you for having me here this evening. And don't forget to watch me on Fox. And what? Thank you. No, no, you don't have to get up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I got to tell you one more thing. I never do this, but I have a book coming out in November. It's called He Killed Them All. It's about Robert Durst. I don't know if you saw the jinx, the HBO jinx. My book will be coming out, and uh, so maybe look for it in November. Thank you all. Uh, yes. Sure. I mean, come on up. Thank you, everyone. Good night.